um, just so you guys all know um, who we are. So um, obviously I'm Martha, I'm one of the vets, and then Emily is one of our vets, and Lou is our BMW marketing manager. So she uh, runs our Facebook page and makes a lot of marketing tools for us and helps us organize client evenings, um, which is great. Um, so a couple of little housekeeping -y things. Um, if you guys are able to mute yourselves whilst we're talking, um, just so that you don't accidentally get um, sort of background noise coming through. And the, I think most things there should be an option to either have, um, I think it's called speaker view or a view where you can see everyone's faces. And we'd recommend putting speaker view on so that you're only getting the one of us that's talking coming up when, you, when we're talking. And then hopefully you should just be able to see my screen in the background. Um, if you can't see my screen, please shout now. Um, and then the other thing to say is if anyone has any questions at all, pop them in the chat box when you think of them. Um, or I think we've got somebody in the waiting room, Lou. Hopefully she's on that. So Let them in. Yeah, if you guys think of any questions during the talk, pop them in the chat box and we'll go through some questions at the end um, and answer anything anyone may have asked. I think that's it. Is that everything, Em? I think so. Perfect. Right. Well, without further ado, we'll see how this goes. I've never done an online client evening before. Um, so, an A to Z of horse health tips. Um, start with A. There we go. There's a happy little horse to say welcome. Um, so A is for asthma. Equine asthma used to be, well, is also known as recurrent airway obstruction in the horse. It's been named lots of things over the years, um, COPD, RAO. Um, our current name for it is equine asthma because it's actually extremely similar to human asthma. Um, it's really, really common, especially in the winter. Um, and clinical signs include an increased respiratory rate, a cough, a runny nose, a heave line, which is, I don't know if you can see on my screen, this horse here has got a line across its abdomen, just here. That's what we call a heave line that generally in, indicates an, it really increased respiratory effort um, or poor performance. Um, diagnosis tends to be made um, initially on an examination. So we'll have a look at your horse um, if you have a lot of those signs, but without a high temperature, um, and we'll often be very suspicious of asthma. Uh, and it can be definitively diagnosed uh, by endoscopy, so popping a little camera into their airways and getting a sample. In terms of what you do about it, it's often twofold. So the management for asthma is almost as important as the actual treatment itself. Management tends to involve, A, as much fresh air as possible, um, the slight caveat to that is there will be occasional horses who actually appear to be allergic to um, grass, summer grass and sort of um, uh, pollens and things in the grass. But the vast majority of them are dust related, so happen in the winter. So turnout is great. Um, a dust free bedding, um, but good ventilation, having either steamed hay or soaked hay and wetting their feed down. Um, so those are all management things that you can do really easily. Something else that we'll often recommend is actually feeding their hay from the floor rather than in a hay net. Um, and that will just really reduce the amount of dust that they're breathing in. Now, if they actually need a bit of help other than management, so if that hasn't made enough of a difference in its own, uh, we'll often recommend a treatment. And that focuses around steroids to reduce the inflammation and to make their lungs work a bit better. Um, and that can be given either orally or actually via inhalers, which is always quite entertaining. Um, or the other drug that we'll often use is clenbuterol. So you've probably come across clenbuterol before. It comes as like granule form and as a liquid form. And that just helps to open up their airways whilst the steroids do the job um, and helps them breathe a bit easier. So B is for bleeding. Um, in terms of how much blood a horse can lose, it's actually surprisingly a lot so I don't know a lot of people have probably seen when horses have nosebleeds after they've been stomach tubed or after they've had something popped up their nose um, or have seen a nasty wound um, where they come in and they look like they're bleeding loads um, actually a 500 kilo horse which is kind of your average thoroughbred um, can lose up to 50 litres of blood without too much of an effect obviously you don't want them to lose 50 litres but they but they can survive that um, 
anything over a 10% loss, so more than 50 litres in a 500 kilo horse, um, then we really worry about. So at that point, you start to see clinical signs of blood loss um, and you start to get quite a poorly horse. Um, 15 to 30 15 to 30% of blood loss, and then you start to see serious problems, and that's when we're when we're really worried. So um sorry about that. They're 50 litres, their total. You said 50, not five. <laughs> so 50 litres their total blood volume, so you wouldn't want to be losing that. <laughs> we don't want them to lose 50 litres of blood. Emily is absolutely right. I can't do maths. Um so, <laughs> 10% of 50 litres will be five litres of blood, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, basically they can lose 10% of their total blood volume before we start to really worry about it. And anything from 15 to 30% is, is quite bad. Um, it's always a really good idea if you're able to, to, to actually try and collect the blood that they're losing. So obviously sometimes with wounds, that's not possible, but certainly from a, if they're having a nosebleed, sticking a bucket under their head means that you can collect how much is coming out of them. Um, and you know you can start to really then measure how much blood you're getting there. Um, a bucket full is obviously not ideal. Um, and then there's ways that you can try to control the bleeding. So first things first, I think if your horse is seriously bleeding, call the vet, get us on the way. Um, and then there's some things that you can do to try and prevent further blood loss whilst you're waiting for us to get there. So um, depending on where it's coming from, applying pressure is really important. Um, so exactly like humans, if you're bleeding, a good way to stop that is by is by putting pressure on it. And the easiest way to do that with a with a limb injury is to put a um, a dressing on. And in a, as a short term thing, you can put a dressing on pretty tight, and um, just to try and try and stem that blood flow. Um, you actually you don't want to keep taking a if a dressing gets soaked through, you don't want to keep taking it off and putting a new one on. Just put a new one over the top. So every time you take that dressing off, you're actually disrupting the um, the blood clot. And um, so basically, lots of layers on, bandage it up nice and tight, and put lots of pressure over it. Um, keep the horse as calm as possible. Keep it still. The more it moves and the more it stresses, the more it's likely to bleed. And um, so if if you're calm and your horse is calm, you're in the best possible situation. And don't be tempted to look. So put that bandage on, leave it on, and let your vet get there. And then we can hopefully find the source of the bleeding and stop it for you. Um, signs that the horse might be losing too much blood um, are them getting weak and shaky, them sweating, colicking, and having a really high of a high heart rate um, and pale mucous membranes. And um, now that it's almost signs from going, let's like say, going into shock, a little bit like a human that's in shock. And um, they look a little bit out of it and a little bit spacey as well. Um, if you start to see any of those things, then it is a, a, a medical emergency. Um, and again, speak to your best and say, you know, this is happening and I'm really worried. Um, and we'll do our absolute best to get there as quickly as physically possible. It's pretty rare that horses lose that much blood, but you will occasionally get a, get a really nasty wound that does that. Um, it's also worth having transport ready so that if they do need to go into the hospital, for example, for example, to have a blood transfusion or something like that, you are ready to go. Um, so yeah, unusual, but it's good to be prepared just in case. C is for carrot stretches, a little bit nicer than bleeding. Um, so this one is just a really nice thing that you can do to kind of keep your horse moving and keep them nice and supple. Um, so carrot stretches harness your horse's natural movement. Uh, to enhance their vertebral joints range of movement, build core strength and increase their flexibility. Um, so use a bait. So with the classic thing is obviously a carrot, hence the term, but you can use any kind of, I'd say low calorie treats to avoid little, little overweight ponies, but um, whatever low calorie treat your horse likes, um, you can get them, encourage them to, to basically use their full range of movement um, and you want them to do it by their own volition. You don't want to force it because that can end up in injury. So different types of flexing that you can do would be um, rounding. So getting them to flex down, I'll, show, uh, I'll be a horse. Um, so flex down or extend up just to get them to, to round off or hollow out and then side to side to lateral bending. So if you stand at their shoulder and get them to stretch around you so they're almost touching their sides. Um, it's really nice doing that just after every time they exercise. It just helps keep them nice and supple uh, once they're nice and warmed up and helps them to, to stay nice and healthy and strong and prevent injury. Um, daily stretches will increase their core strength and flexibility really nicely. So, 
went too far. In terms of the environment that you want for carrot stretches, just a nice level area, it doesn't matter too much, just nowhere where you're really on a slope up or down. Um, you want your handler to avoid standing in the kick zone for obvious reasons and identify your escape path if the horse does become unbalanced. So that's a little health and safety tip. Um, and having a, a longish um, treat, say like a, exactly like a carrot or like one of those nice treats that are a decent length um, will avoid you having your fingers taken. Um, you can also use licks for this, so like the molasses licks work really nicely. Um, and then try and get them to hold for 10 to 15 seconds and then relax and repeat. Um, if you stand parallel to a wall, it reduces the chances of the horse peaking. And there's just some nice examples of some horses doing some carrot stretches. Um, and so getting them the idea, getting them to really bend round and um, flex down. Um, and, and also, if you can see that, also stretch out in front, which is one that we don't often think about, but it just really gets them stretching their neck out um, and really using all their muscles. And I say after exercise is the best time to do it. But beware, don't attempt on horses diagnosed with neck problems or ataxia. Um, ataxia means wobbly horses. Um, you'll know if you're, well, if, if we've diagnosed that, you should be very much aware of it. Um, it can, if they have a slight neck problem or if they are wobbly, then actually making them do those stretches can end up in them becoming unbalanced. And um, actually, if they don't appear to be very comfortable doing their carrot stretches, that can be quite a nice thing to, to tell your vet to sort of look for any underlying pain um, or you know anything that might be going on underlying. So for example, it's quite you can often diagnose neck pain by saying, well, get an idea they might have neck pain by saying, oh, they're not very comfortable going that way. Um, and it's a, a nice little little piece of information that you can give your vet. If you are in any doubt, just give us a give us a shout. And then B is for dosing medications. Um, I'm sure we've all been in a situation where we're trying to get drugs into ponies that don't want to eat those drugs. Um, and there's a few little handy tips here that can um, that can really help um, to get them eating. So. Um, to see what the next slide is. Yeah, fine. So Persend would be one of the most common tap, sorry, Perglide would be one of the most common drugs that we use um, that can just um, avoid them eating that uh, they don't like to eat. Bute is another really classic one, so, um, phenylbutazone, it's pain relief. They hate eating it, but it can be really good for them. And here's a few little things that we've discovered over the years can be very good for getting them to eat drugs. So. Ribena, I always say for horses that you're trying to give antibiotics to in their feed, Ribena is excellent for take, for hiding the taste. And um, so as it, there's a certain type of yellow antibiotics that you may well have all come across before um, that's quite bitter tasting. And Ribena seems to take that bitterness out of it. So a little bit of that in their feed is really helpful. Um, mint arrows are one, a, a wonderful for um, little, you can take the top off, hide something in it and give them to that. Same for polos. Um, and then pouring out apples and carrots can work really nicely as well. Um, malt loaf balls are another great idea. It basically just allows you to hide something in it, roll the malt loaf up nicely and give it as a little treat. Um, my one caveat to all of these is that I wouldn't do some of them on a daily basis because they might actually have quite high calories. So the malt loaf would be a good example of that. Um, but there's all, all sorts of little tips and tricks for getting drugs into ponies. Um, so tablets, sometimes they're much better to be hidden in warm water or well, dissolved in warm water um, and then hide them in a meal. Um, and you can disguise things with things like ground mint or peppermint tea um, or even peppermint cordial. So um, things the horses love the taste of um, can really help to, uh, to hide those things. Uh, finally, some things are actually much easier being syringed in rather than um, given um, in food. And if your horse does need something syringed into them, my the thing I find the best every time is natural yogurt. I love mixing things with natural yogurt. That's what I always reach for. Um, it makes a lovely paste, so it's a bit more like a wormer, um, and it just makes everything go in a bit smoother, and it means that it's less liquidy, so it doesn't end up flying all over the stable, hitting you in the face, hitting the horse in the face, and most of it ending up on the floor. Um, molasses, lovely thick molasses, also work really, work really well for that. Um, so those are all good little top tips for making your horse take their drugs. And also applesauce, which we all like. And now I'm going to hand over to Emily for a little while. Mute myself. 
<laughs> Fine, Mark, you might have to click my screen across unless I can. Yeah, no worries. I'll, um, if you, I'll, I'll, yeah, that's fine. I am clicking, I promise. It's just not doing it. There we go. Okay, Dick. E is for um, emergencies, which inevitably owning horses, unfortunately, we'll probably see it at one stage or another. Um, Mars covered a couple of them already. Um, obviously, colic, no one wants to see. And sadly, a lot of the time with colic, um, we'd love to be able to tell people exactly why it's happened. But the reality of it is, sadly, um, we often don't know. And there's not as much research as what we would like um, into the causes of colic. Um, and so sometimes, as long as the horse gets better, that's all we we really worry about. If you have a have a colicky horse, um, the best thing to do absolutely is, is phone the vet um, and probably do that sooner rather than later. Um, if you can, walking them round is good and keep them moving, but obviously only if that's safe. Um, and sometimes I think the hardest ones where you sort of find them in the morning and you don't know how long they've been colicking for but again if you can get them up and, and walking and that is often the best thing um they shouldn't be given anything to eat even if you know you think you want to see whether they can um have an appetite or not it's probably best not to not to give them anything until we've assessed them or at least have a phone call to us lameness is um uh, obviously another common um problem that we see um not normally an emergency but obviously if they're non-weight bearing then we'd always suggest um calling us relatively quickly to come and have a look or if the lameness is getting progressively worse then absolutely we should come sooner rather than later um things that cause severe lameness obviously fit abscesses um we've probably all seen them are one of the most common things um and can be quite rewarding to treat but sometimes you do get some really nasty ones um that aren't necessarily straight straightforward i think we talk about those later on um lymphangitis is when they get very swollen legs horses are very badly designed um in the sense they can sometimes get a very small wound a small amount of bacteria um can get into their legs and it can cause quite a substantial um swelling another terrible design is they've got all these joints that don't like to get injured or very close to the ground um and septic joints is another another one that would be an emergency that do require surgery to be to be fixed um Obviously, fractures in horses, sadly, um, most of the time are catastrophic. Unfortunately, we can't put them in a cage like we can with cats and dogs and tell them to rest. Um, they've got to be able to, to move around and ambulate. There's certain fractures, um, depending on their severity and things, that we can, if we can stabilise them and keep the horses comfortable, then they can be on protective box rest, but um, it's normally sort of several months before they're allowed to sort of even come out there stable again. Foalings, um, I don't think you guys deal too many deal with too many of these, but um, generally with horses, it should be over and done within about 30 minutes. Um, and any delay to that is is very detrimental to the to the mare and the foal. So um, for us, we see these as, as real emergencies. By the time someone's ringing us, um, we, we often have to just drop everything and go, even if we're with other other clients and things. So um, Fortunately, they, they are normally quite good at sorting themselves out um, and have foals over night time. So most of them, the vast majority of them are absolutely fine on their own. Um, eyes is another one. I think it's very easy to kind of be a bit blasé about eyes and just say, oh, we'll give it a little while and see what happens. Um, we'd always much rather, even if we don't come out immediately, that you just give us a ring about horse's eyes um, and then we can have a chat and see whether we need to come out immediately or, um, you know, see see how it goes but generally a very small problem can get quite serious quite quickly um with horses so we'd always rather see them sooner rather than later yeah again as i said just just get us get us on the phone um as martha already alluded to absolutely transport ready to go um if that's necessary is the right thing and that's what you guys are really lucky in a sense that you're so close to a referral centre um, and it's just around the corner some people are literally a matter of hours away so it's obviously adds to the stress when you've got to then transport the horse all that way um, and again absolutely you've got to stay calm ask a friend or something to come with you um, or at least wait with you for the vet um, would be would be the way 
F is for horrible flies, um, which obviously we all hate. And even, you know, again, the management of flies, there's relatively little we can we can do that's massively effective, hence why there's lots of lots of options. Um, and they're obviously um affected by sort of the standard horse flies in the, the midges causing sweet itch, which we talk about later. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, there's lots of different options and generally when there's lots of options for something means that one alone is not necessarily particularly effective, but avoidance is the best thing. So barriers of fly rugs and masks. And I don't know, I'm sure you've already read it, but there's there's a really nice study done on um, colours of, of rugs and it made it, yeah, on, made it onto radio too, actually, this study. Um, but yeah, a zebra pattern seems to be the way forward um, and they had the least number of flies on them. So if you're going to buy a fly rug, then maybe that would be something worth investing in um, if you can bear for your horse to look slightly ridiculous in the field. Um, yeah, absolutely good Good yard hygiene is really important. Um, mucking out stables regularly and get the muck away from the yard and not kept near the stables is, is the best thing for that. Um, so there's, yeah, there's obviously several products to avoid um, flies, the methylene base, cypermethylene fly sprays and things are really good um there's certain ones that you can apply every couple of weeks um and i find those the most effective really um out of all of them and that's what i use on on my horse and things but yeah there's plenty on the on the shelf but i think if you're really battling with it then do give us a shout because there's certain ones that have drugs in rather than just the ones you get from the from the feed merchants and things and sometimes they're a bit more more effective This is so Professor Derek what nothing about is um a, a vet that's supposedly retired now, but he just never actually seems to seems to retire. He's based up at Liverpool and he's an absolute super duper skin specialist. Um and he has this recipe for um fly repellent, which I have to say I haven't actually used myself, but um maybe I will do. <laughs> Give it a go. Yeah, so again, some some horses don't seem to be bothered by the flies, others get horrible horrible fly bite reactions. Um, and again, you know, absolutely a lot of them you can deal with at home by yourself. Um, but if you're worried or if they start really itching them or they get oozy and things, then absolutely give us a ring. So gastric ulcers um, is another relatively common problem um, that we're sort of learning more and more about as the years go on. Um, this is a, a, a diagram of the of the horse's stomach, um, and there's two different types of ulcers that, that horses can get, um, and either squamous or, or glandular ulcers. So um, at the top of the screen, the two pictures actually relate to the, the pylorus, so the very bottom of the stomach. And sort of even 10 years ago when we did gastroscopy, we were never looking down here for ulcers. We just popped ourselves with the scope into the top of the stomach, which is the bottom two pictures um, looked there and if a horse didn't have ulcers there then we'd say they didn't have ulcers at all so um, again you know research is getting better and better every few years and we're now knowing that we have to look in the whole stomach so a lot of people sort of look symptomatically for, for horses with ulcers and there's a lot of different signs um, and you know sort of the crux of it is basically unless you're going to gastroscope your horse which is putting a camera down into their stomach you're not going to be able to tell um, whether or not they've got ulcers or not, there's no sort of specific signs. They're all very generalised um, and often can be sort of behavioural problems rather than, than um, an issue with, with gastric ulcers. But essentially, again, um, you know, a lot of horses can have ulcers and not be bothered by them. And a lot of horses can have very mild ulcers um, and they can severely bother them. So, um, again, it's a case of, of treating them and see whether you get an improvement in um in clinical signs and generally there's there's a very good success rate with, with treating them but the general general signs we'd see would be poor appetite or picky horses that just don't really want to finish up their food properly and um, weight loss is is another sign and sort of a dull starey coat would be another um if they're sort of resistance to extending or collecting their stride or or resistance when you're changing transition that's a another quite classic one um but yeah, some anecdotal suggestions would be that they're a bit girthy and things like that and sensitive to touch on the abdomen. There's not any hard and fast evidence to suggest these are necessarily um, linked, but that's certainly what some people some people do see. So preventing them, um, 
turnout is absolutely the best thing for, for horses and raising is, um, yeah, Dr. Green, as they say, is by far and away the best thing for horses to be on a diet of, providing they're not going overweight is the, is the obvious one. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of research done into gastric ulcers, multiple forage sources, so having hay and haylage um, in your stable is a, is a good idea. Um, I know back when I was in pony club, they said don't feed before you exercise them and things. And we now know that's actually quite, quite wrong. Um, and if you are, you have got horses sort of susceptible to gastric ulcers, then we do suggest they have some chaff um, half an hour before, before exercise. Um, and that sort of helps the, the stomach acid not splash um, the top of the stomach, which is a, is a cause of the, of the, of the um, ulcers. So just, I don't know if any of you've heard of our, of our horse health programme. Um, it's something that we offer um, for a small monthly fee of, I think it says, it says 10.99 there. I think it's might be 11.99 now, there we go. Um, and that includes um, sort of, I would say most importantly, being interested in a, a dental, which includes a cost of a sedation, um, your vaccination and an annual health check um, and or worm accounts and a wormer. So all your worming um, sort of tests are covered throughout the year and we're more than happy whether you're on the horse health plan or not to give you advice on worming. We'd really, really like to let our clients know this. We'd much rather you ring us um, and get sort of sound advice on worming than sort of guess and muddle through and speak to feed merchants about it. Um, resistance is becoming a real problem. It's something that, you know, we're going to have to ultimately be <laughs> responsible for. Um, and so absolutely, we are more than happy to speak to people about worming, um, of course, free of charge and just ring us up and, and get some advice. You do get as well 20% off your lifetime medications um, and 10% off all veterinary treatment. So um, it is a really good plan. I think if you use it properly, um, you can save yourself quite a lot of money um, throughout the year. I went off too quick. No, no, no that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> All right, shall I take back over with I? Mm -hmm. So, I is for injuries. So, something that we probably all see pretty frequently, I imagine. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so, on the, let me just get rid of that so I can see. Um, a, a really common injury would be a, a kick wound. And um, that's one of the classics of ponies that share fields together. Um, so on the pictures we've got here, um, this, the, the leg x-ray that you've got over here is a horse that's obviously had a kick into its splint bone. Um, so this is its splint bone here. Um, it's got a nasty little fracture going on just here. And that horse, I imagine, is probably pretty lame. And um, it's also, I think, got a little little dink out of its cannon bone as well. So that's had quite a nasty kick injury. It's got a, a fractured splint bone and a bit of a damaged cannon bone. Um, that would be a, a classic example of a horse that's had a bit of a barney with another horse in the field and, and come off worse for wear. Um, I think that one of the really important things with kick wounds um, is that the, given how strong a horse is, you often can't fully appreciate the damage from the outside. Um, it might be they have quite a small wound um, but something quite nasty like this going on underneath. So I think if in any doubt, um, it's worth getting us to check them over um, and see if they need any x-rays or, or ultrasound to check that the underlying structures haven't been affected. Um, the other thing that I think is really important with horse wounds to appreciate is that any wound over a joint has the potential to be quite bad. Um, so horse joints are really terribly designed in many ways. Um, so that the blood flow to the joint um, is quite sealed off. So if you have an infection that gets into a joint, um, giving the horse antibiotics by mouth doesn't really go, doesn't touch it. Um, we tend to need to treat joint infections with surgery because um, it's such a sealed off little section. You need to basically go in there and flush it out. Um, so any small, even any wound over a joint, even if it's small, um, is always worth being checked out. If it turns out to be sepsis, we need to deal with it promptly and, um, and handle it as soon as possible to, to prevent any sort of nasty ongoing joint infection. Um, and then sprains and strains um, can occur whilst out being ridden or just out in the field. It's amazing what a horse can do to itself in a field. Um, I'm sure we've all seen silly things that horses will come in from the field with. Um, this image down here is an ultrasound scan. Um, so 
the ultrasound scanner is showing the tendons that run down the back of a horse's cannon bone here. Um, and this large structure at the top is the check ligament. Um, that's the one on the most outside at the top of the horse's leg. It's quite a common injury in middle-aged horses is to, is to injure their check ligament. Um, and this horse has obviously injured theirs. It's got a nice black hole in the center of its, uh, of its ligament where it should be nice, normal tendon fiber like this, normal tendon down here. Um, this is really enlarged, it's got a big hole in it. Um, and that's something that you'd probably be suspicious of looking at the leg, but then you can ultrasound it to confirm your diagnosis and sort of we can say, okay, it's got this, it's gonna need some rest, it's gonna need some icing and give you a, a good plan of, um, of what the horse might need. Um, so there's some really good little, sorry, first aid tips that you can get in the habit of um, whilst you're waiting for us to come check a horse over. Um, so getting your horse into a stable or a nice safe clean area is really good. Um, cleaning the wound with really clean water um, or cold hosing any swellings are really good starting points. Um, we've talked before a little bit about bleeding, but putting some pressure on if they're bleeding, that's, if they're bleeding badly. Um, and just trying to keep the horse still and calm, as we said before. Um, if, you, if the wound is bad enough to need a vet, don't give any pain relief. Um, it's really good for us to actually see how comfortable the horse is. It's quite important in sort of diagnosing things to know how lame the wound makes the horse. Um, so if we're coming to see it, don't give any pain relief unless we advise you to. Um, and we can then, once we've seen the horse, seen where the wound is and seen how comfortable the horse is, we can then advise what pain relief that horse should have. Um, it's always really nice having a bucket of clean water ready for, for the vet for a wound. Um, in the winter, it's really nice to have a bucket of clean warm water, that's even better. Um, and then it just means we're ready to give it a lovely clean up um, and see what's going on. Uh, this is a lovely graze on the horse's knee. That's, that's beautiful. Um, so J is for jump to it. <laughs> um, so we just want to talk a little bit about um, the benefits of raised pole training. Um, so it's, it's a really lovely little technique that we can use alongside your sort of everyday exercise just to help build um, muscle and strength. So pole work, oh sorry, um, improves the range of movement through the limbs. Um, it's really nice for increasing hind limb engagement. So we'll often talk about a horse's top line and about their core strength um, and sort of wanting to build their bum muscles and their back muscles and just get their top line really strong and engaged. Um, and getting them to, to pick their legs up over poles is a really nice way of doing that. It strengthens, strengthens their core, it improves their balance and proprioception, which is not a word that I enjoy saying. Um, and that basically means their foot placement. So proprioception is where they put their feet. Um, so this is lovely for horses that you want them to jump and you want them to get you know, tidier with their jumping. Doing lots of raised pole work is excellent training for that. And you can also use it to help to sort of encourage them to increase their stride length and encourage rhythm. Um, so yeah, it's just a really nice little aid that you can use alongside your regular training to, to get them using themselves a bit better, strengthen their core um, and using all their muscles. Um, you can do it pretty cheaply. Um, so this delightful picture um, is something that we've, I've seen a couple of clients use and it's literally potties um, and literally get a couple of potties um, pop a pole across them and it just raises it a few inches off the floor um, and it makes a lovely little raised pole that's not really a jump it's just a nice raised pole that the horse can lift their legs over um, and do some strength training with um, and actually you know you'd say what speed should I do these in when your horse is getting used to raised poles I'd literally just walk them over it um, and just get them used to placing their legs and, and strengthening and lengthening over them. Um, once you're a bit more advanced and your horse is more familiar with it, you can also do it in trot, but um, I'd start off with walk and just get them, get them using their legs properly. Um, and yeah, don't come home with loads of other impulse purchases. We all know what IKEA is like. Um, so biomechanical studies have shown that when trotting over poles, horses increase their flexion through their limbs rather than just lifting their whole bodies higher. Um, the impact on landing is no greater than trotting on flat ground. So um, it's a really nice little thing that you can add into to a horse without, it doesn't put any extra strain through their joints or through their feet, um, but it can just help strengthen them a bit more. It's a really nice way of rehabbing after injury once their trot is symmetrical again. Uh, oh, sorry, I've already said half of this, but start off and walk and only move on to trot once you're happier. Um, and adjust the poles to fit your horse's stride at first. 
Um, and once you're happy that your horse is confident doing it at their normal gait, then you can help to sort of lengthen it a little bit. Um, it does work them quite hard, so limit it to just 10 to 15 minutes at a time, ideally. K is for kissing spine. Now, the proper term for kissing spine is overriding dorsal spinous processes, or ODSP, we often shorten it to, but a lot of people know it as kissing spine, so it's a, a useful, useful term for us to talk about. And this essentially means, um, means that they're, so their spinous processes, this, this here is an x-ray of a horse's back, um, and their spinous processes are these bits that stick up here, um, and you'd imagine the horse's saddle would sit on top here. So this is just their, their back, sort of where the saddle would sit. Um, <clears throat> and with, with kissing spine, these spinous processes get too close together and they'll rub on each other and they'll end up with pain from where the bone's rubbing and also musculoskeletal pain from the surrounding muscles because they tend to tense up and hold themselves quite uncomfortably. Um, the most common signs we'll see would be bucking, rearing, resentment of saddle placement, um, lacking in top in muscle so if you've got a horse that you feel like is doing all the exercises where they should be building muscle in their back but they're just not and um, that can be an indication of it um, and it can actually be quite subtle um, you can see it in a lot of competition horses x race horses are a classic for this um, and you know there's a lot of individual variation so ir irritability when being girthed or having their back rushed is, is, is not another one and then struggling with their canter and with transitions and just not enjoying holding themselves properly. Um, so if you're suspicious, we'd always advise getting us to have a look at them. We'll have a good prod and a poke at the horse, have a feel of them on the yard. Um, and then if it seems sensible, we'll probably say, let's get some backup x-rays. Um, and the, well, I would say the gold standard for x-raying their backs is for them to come into us and have it done at the hospital. Um, the x-ray machine that we have at the hospital is just much more powerful than the one we can bring out on the road so you can get much nicer pictures of their back. Um, and if we find they do have it, so these are some pictures of horses that have had kissing spine. This one on the left here is one before it's had treatment. So you can see there's all these little angry bits of bone that have grown out and are just rubbing on each other. And those lovely spaces that we had in the normal in the normal horse in the photo before aren't there anymore. And this can make them really, really sore um, because these bones just shouldn't be touching at all. Um, and you can see there's lots of angry bone proliferation up here. Um, so if it's not too severe, sometimes we can medicate their backs. That's often one of our first treatments. Um, and we medicate the back with steroids um, to reduce the inflammation in the area. Um, if they have moderate to severe kissing spine, then we'll do. Then we'll normally recommend surgery, um, and that basically is um, we essentially. I think this picture on the right here is a horse post surgery, and we actually come in and take away those little extra bits of bone and widen those spaces up again so that the bones aren't rubbing on each other anymore. Um, it's done standing. It's quite a nice surgery actually, in that the horse tends to be able to not have an anaesthetic. It's just all done under standing sedation. Um, and then we take x-rays during the procedure to make sure that we're happy that we've taken enough bone um, and that the horse is going to be a lot more comfortable. Um, one of the biggest things after kissing spine surgery is that they tend to have quite a long period of rehab um, for obvious reasons, because we're making an incision right along their back. Um, they can't have a saddle on for at least 12 weeks. Um, so a lot of the rehab focuses on strengthening their core and building top line um, but without ridden exercise. So we'll often recommend the use of lunging aids and um, like equiamis and pessoas and that sort of thing to really help strengthen their core and strengthen the horse, um, but without without a rider on board. Um, and we'll always ask, um, we'll always recommend getting a um, registered physio involved as well for them to be involved in the rehab as well. Um, and then, lovely. I think that's four for me, is it? Em? Am I back to you again? or you're muted. Okay, so yeah, L is for laminitis, which again, um, is probably one of the most common problems we see with horses. Um, and essentially it's an inflammation of the lamini, which this picture um, quite nicely demonstrates. So um, 
you have interlocking layers um, between the hoof wall and the and the bone underneath, and they're called the laminae, and they're a bit like the springs on a on a trampoline. So they're what hold um, the hoof, the outer hoof wall down to the bone, and and obviously they get inflamed. And as you can imagine, then putting 500 kilos through that, um, it can be an extremely painful and debilitating condition. Mild laminitis um, is relatively straightforward to to treat and, and generally the mild cases will respond really quickly with the appropriate management. Um, but sadly, if they if they go the wrong way, then um, this picture is, is quite a nice way of demonstrating it. But essentially you get the, the pedal bone, um, which is the bottom bone in the, in the foot, and that can rotate downwards away from the, the hoof wall and um, ultimately very sadly can come through the bottom of the, the foot. So it is a very, a very serious condition and needs to be treated um, quite quickly and, and appropriately. Um, and again, um, absolutely get hold of us as soon as you suspect it um, and we can give you advice and, and come and see the horse for you. Um, so yeah, as is those pictures, of those comments suggest what I um, spoke of before, but absolutely the pedal bone can, can rotate and eventually drop and detach, um, which, is, it, is called sap is founder. So again, these are um, radiographs of, of a horse that's had both rotation and, and sinking of the pedal bone. Um, and so, yeah, often with these cases, if they don't respond quickly to treatment, we will suggest radiographing their feet and ensuring that this isn't what's happening or, or looking like it's going to happen um, because we sometimes have to intensify the management of these cases um, when they're, if they are going the, the wrong way. So yeah, the, the cases that don't respond quickly, there's plenty we can do. Um, we work with lots of different farriers um, and they are very good at their jobs and they can provide all sorts of different shoes um, to help make the horses more comfortable. And also even the, the comfortable ones when they're going back into to work and things, then we'll often work with the farrier to, to put specific kind of shoes on. Um, at the bottom there, you can see what we what's an imprint shoe or a glue on shoe. Um, and that's for horses if we don't think it's fair and, and they're not going to be comfortable enough by hammering um, nails into their feet, then we can often use blue on shoes as well. So underlying conditions um, that can cause a horse to be predisposed to laminitis, um, I'm sure you've heard of Cushing's before, um, and it's a, the posh name for it is the pituitary pars intermedia dysfunction, and that's a little um, gland at the bottom of their brain, um, and there can be an imbalance there in the, in the hormones that that's secreting. Um, currently, the blood sampling for this is free of charge. Um, sorry, the blood sampling isn't free of charge. The lab fees are free of charge. Um, so if you're questioning whether your horse potentially has signs of Cushing's, then um, absolutely it's probably worth getting them, getting them tested for that. <laughs> Emma's for mud fever, which again, we're all battling away at this time of year um, and hoping to get for the spring and out the mud um, and so we can stop dealing with it. So basically the cause is bacteria that thrives in, in damp, muddy conditions. Um, you get horrible, really sore, scabby areas on the backs of their heels and, and sometimes come right up onto their, their lower limbs. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's the same bacteria basically that causes, oh, I'm not sure what's going on, Mar. What's going on, Zoe? I've lost your screen. Oh, that's unfortunate. It's still on mine. I haven't done anything. Um, um, maybe it's mine. Hang on a sec. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you see? Can you yeah. See it? What yeah. There. Anyway, um, yeah. Essentially, it's the same bacteria that causes causes rain scold, um, which obviously they get them on their back and things. Um, do you want to the next slide, Math? So yeah, treatment. Um, the the mainstay of it is to try and keep their legs dry, which is far easier said than done at this time of year. Um, you need to clip the hair away. Ultimately, um that's where the bacteria thrive or in horrible, soggy, damp conditions. So um, if you clip the hair away, it means the legs can dry out properly. If you can clean them with really, really dilute um, hippie scrub or, or chlorhexidine, and I wouldn't suggest doing that repeated times, but I think 
initially that's a good way of doing it you need to basically get the scabs off initially um another good way of doing that is wrapping their legs in in cling film and then bandaging them for an hour or so and that lets all the scabs soften and the horses aren't don't present so much you then taking the the scabs off um without sounding like a salesman this is one of my favorite products that we um make up ourselves is the cracked heel cream and i find it's the only really one that's really effective with the with the mud fever it's got steroids and antibiotics in it um and so they really act locally where the problem is um and i yeah i really really like them i've had it before with <laughs> really unhandled horrible horses that you can't get near um we really heavily sedate them clip their legs off put loads of this this cracked heel cream on um and that seems to to sort them out with with one shot so really really effective effective cream um if they get really severe occasionally we give them what's called systemic antibiotics and pain relief which basically means um it goes in orally rather than put directly onto the skin um and occasionally we do have ones that need need oral antibiotics as well to, to properly get on top of it um but yeah advanced cases will will really make horses quite quite sore other conditions that can look a bit like mud fever um but are treated differently is a, is a vasculitis or photosensitization and these are often some really interesting cases to see i'm just gonna put a picture in but um you know you can get cobs where the, the white areas of their skin are affected and the and the black areas aren't um and it can ultimately be down to the problem with their liver um but yeah they can get like raised really sore areas on the white bits of skin and the, the rest of it's okay or those horses that get horribly scabby um muzzles and, and backs of their heels that can be due to to photosensitization rather than just mud fever so um if you think you've got mud fever and it's not going away then absolutely again it could be something else so it's worth worth talking to us and seeing if you're on the right track with your treatment <laughs> prevention um washing their legs off is probably not the best thing to do because all you're doing is making them damp i know it's hard when you've got um horses coming in covered in mud and you want to clean them off before they go into the nice stables but if they are susceptible to mud fever this is probably the worst thing you can you can do um absolutely plenty of people wash the horse's legs off when they come in and they get away with it and they don't have a problem but for any horses that are susceptible to mud fever this would be the wrong thing wrong thing to do um they've said in here about turn out socks and things um without sounding like i'm conjured Predicting it, I, I don't particularly like these. I think sometimes mud gets stuck underneath them and actually makes the problem worse. So um, I would be more for just keeping their legs dry um, and brushing them off when the mud's, the mud's dry. I don't know what you think, Mark, but I, yeah, I would agree. That's with I've, them. I've actually seen horses get really sore underneath those. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> Babies. So neonates or, or foals, um, again, we see a fair few of these. We're about to come into our into our stud season. It will go a bit mad with them. But um, again, generally, um, they do very well. They're very, they thrive well. They look after themselves. We just need to make sure they're doing all the all the things they should be. Um, so generally, they should have a drink within, within two hours. They should certainly be standing within an hour, um, normally far before that. Um, they should be passing droppings within four hours and urinating within eight hours and, and you know the mare should be showing that she's attentive to the to the foal and the foal should be interested in the mare and not sort of on cloud cuckoo and, and not really know what's going on um, and if that is the case then absolutely um, they can turn into moments quite quickly so it's always worth just checking them quite soon yeah so signs of things that aren't aren't right with foals is them not doing what they're supposed to do basically um and obviously temperature as it goes with any horse if that's higher than 39 then for foals that's that's what's considered normal with horses obviously anything above 38.5 we'd rather see them um and again any lameness or um if their umbilicus is swollen then that's not not ideal and they're quite prone to impaction so the meconium which is what comes out first in their droppings that can sometimes cause an impaction and again they'll be straining without being able to pass anything um it's pretty gross but they're actually quite <laughs> quite satisfying to treat with an enema and you suddenly get a very very happy foal very quickly so um again anything that doesn't quite seem right it probably isn't right and yeah the vet should should be involved 
O is for obesity, which again, sadly, we do see far too far too much of. Um, I think it's a bit like Labradors. We're kind of used to seeing the, the fat Labradors and therefore that's what they should all look like. Um, and I think it's the same with our horses. We're far too accepting of horses becoming big and fat and they and they really shouldn't be. Um, showing, I think, it's got much better than what it used to be and horses should be fit, not fat now. Um, but certainly before it was thought that if your horse is in good condition it has to be overweight and then that's not the case at all um the biggest risk with it with obesity um is leading to insulin resistance or essentially diabetes in in horses um and that then in turn leads to laminitis which as we discussed is a pretty terrible terrible um disease and yeah i mean it says here about insurance like to be affected i think yeah regardless of insurance we shouldn't be having having obese horses Having said that, there's plenty of people that are doing everything right and they still seem to be struggling with their horse's weight. Um, we've got a BMW Shape Up Club, which um, I'm currently running at the moment, which is for those horses where you think you're doing everything and you're not quite sure why a horse isn't losing weight. Um, we can help you with that, again, free of charge, and, and we can go through some things that can help and make sure that everything is 100% um, helping your horse with how his diet and exercise and things. Um, so... If your horse is struggling to lose weight, this is something we might talk about, is the equine metabolic syndrome, um, which is similar to, to diabetes in, in humans. Um, and to do that, we can do a do a blood test and that can give us a result. And the key to its treatment is management, basically. Um, but it just means we can we can potentially help you with certain drugs and things um, if we're if we're really struggling. Yeah, so essentially it's the same with humans in the sense if, if they're overweight, they need to exercise more and, and eat less. Um, horses actually need a very considerably small amount of food. I think we're used to packing our hay nets full and actually um, they can sort of get away with 1.5% of their body weight forage, body weight and forage. Um, so it's it's actually, you know, not an awful lot of food that they need. But I think, as I said, if you're worried, then just get in touch with us and we can give you some advice with that said that haven't we really yeah cool all right we're back to me p oh no yeah right so p is for poultice um so i suspect having seen foot abscesses you guys have probably all seen uh poultices in the flesh um so poultices essentially will help to draw pus out of a foot abscess um it's a, they always come well they either come as like a long roll that you can cut um cut bits off or um can you hear me emily yeah yeah okay. yeah um or it sometimes comes as actually like a little foot shaped pad which is great um they always have plastic on one side and the plastic side always wants to be away from the sole so the squidgy side against the foot plastic away from the foot and that will just help to draw everything out um, we tend to advise putting them on hot, well, warm and wet when you're first putting them on to try and draw something out. Um, and then sometimes we'll say, actually, after you've done a few days of a warm, wet poultice, switch to a, a dry poultice to keep things covered. Um, baby nappies are perfectly designed to fit over the top of a poultice to provide some padding. Uh, big fan of a, of a nappy, so um, it's always worth having a couple of them in your first aid kit. And you can basically place your toe, place the horse's toe in the crotch of the nappy and then use the Velcro to do it up around the foot. That works beautifully. Um, and then put some vet wrap around it just to attach everything on. Um, make sure the vet wrap is not applied directly over the skin. You always want to have some padding in the way. Um, and you can put some padding over the past and if you need to go higher just to protect the skin and make sure nothing's too tight. Um, to avoid lots of sellotape noises, which horses tend to have a bit of an issue with, um, you can make a pre-made duct tape square, as seen here. And basically that's just a few layers of duct tape overlapping um, so that it's nice and thick. Um, and you can just place that as a square over the poultice once you've put it on um, and just go around it a couple of times with some duct tape to seal everything in. And that's just a lovely ready-made poultice. Um, so for a pus in the foot or anything where you're trying to draw something out of the foot, um, that works beautifully. Um, if you put a warm, hot, wet poultice on, we'll often advise changing it once or twice daily, depending slightly on what's going on with it. Um, if it's just a dry poultice, then just once a day is normally fine. 
Um, you should always avoid applying duct tape or vet wrap directly over the skin without padding out, out, out underneath, because um, it can just help, it can just damage the skin. Um, and one thing is that I would say is often if you put the duct tape too high so that it's covering above the coronary band, it often makes the coronary band get really sweaty. So I try to keep my duct tape as low down as possible. Um, so Q is for quidding. So quidding is um, a name for when a horse um, drops food um, when they're eating. Um, and it is normally due to dental problems, well, almost always due to dental problems. So um, it's really important to do a really thorough dental examination uh, whenever we're doing horses' teeth. And that's why we'll often say if your horse is not very, very well behaved, we really recommend getting them sedated to have their teeth done. And then we can pick up any weird or wonderful things they may have going on. So a really common cause of quidding is what we call a diastema, which is basically a little gap between two teeth. Um, so this picture on the left is, um, is two of their cheek teeth, and you can see there's just a gap between the cheek teeth that's allowing food to get stuck in it. Um, and they tend to get food that packs up and up and up, and then it pushes on their gum, makes their gum really sore, and it means that they basically get food balling up in this area and not moving through the mouth, and then they drop bits out again. It can, make, it can be really quite painful, these gaps, and um, so it's always worth us identifying them flushing the food out as much as possible, um, and then potentially doing some more advanced dental work if they need it. Um, so yeah, it's good to know if your horse has these. Um, so one of the things that we'll always do is make sure that if, we're, if we see a diastema, we'll try and get as much food out of it as we can at the time. So really flush the diastema out. And actually um, this middle picture here is a good example of a horse that's had that done. You can see how sore the gum was by the fact that it's actually been made to bleed a little bit. Um, so this was probably extremely painful for the horse and they'll feel much better for not having that food packed into it. Um, and sometimes with advanced diastomas like this, we'll then pack the diastoma with some, essentially some putty. So this is like a bridging procedure that we've got here. Stop food getting stuck in there again. Um, one of the other common causes of quidding would just be sharp teeth. Um, so this left-hand picture is a horse that's got really sharp enamel points. Um, and you can actually see that these sharp points here um, are rubbing on the horse's on the horse's cheek and causing little little ulcers just here and here, um, and that will make them really sore as well. So regular dental work is is really important. We normally say six months to twelve months, depending on the horse's mouth. Um, and as I say, we'll often recommend sedating horses to have their teeth done so that we can do a really thorough dental exam, um, unless they are immaculately behaved. Um, we so. All of our vets are, are trained in dentistry, but we also work with a couple of people who are, they're not vets, but they are trained dental technicians. They are British Association of Equine Dental Technician trained, um, which actually involves a huge amount of training um, and a huge amount of, of case logs and things like that. So we have two equine dental technicians, um, Lucinda and Zoe, and they are brilliant. They come and do big yards with us. So if you ever have a load of horses' teeth that need doing in one go, get in touch with us and we can organise for one of us and one of the dental technicians to come and do a a load of horses in one go and just get set up um, like this lovely picture on the right hand side and and get a load of them done in one go. Um, the, the left hand side picture is a slightly more old-fashioned approach to the situation but um, yeah I think equine dentistry is an area that's really really moved on in the last few years. Um, so R is for reproduction. Um, I'll whiz through this um, because I know it's not quite so relevant for you guys but um, it's an interesting conversation to have. So um, Mares can be gotten foal using either fresh, chilled or frozen semen, and you can get that from all over the world, um, not just stallions in the UK. We actually, not as ourselves, but we actually work directly with a team of stud vets that literally do reproduction all day, every day. That's their bread and butter. Um, and they go to big studs and they do lots of ultrasound examinations of the uterus and the ovaries um, in order to accurately time insemination to improve pregnancy rates. Um, younger mares are more fertile and from the age of six the uterus um, starts to show some degeneration. Um, that said we do have healthy brood mares breeding well into their 20s um, but we tend to say if you've got a mare that hasn't had a foal before I wouldn't start later in life. Um, the gestation length of the mare is approximately 11 months but it can be really really variable and quite hard to predict and um, it tends to be between 325 and 365 days. Um, because of this and the urgency to deliver the foal once labour is initiated, we highly, highly recommend um, putting the mare with an experienced stud or breeder for the foaling process. 
um, so the studs were, that will literally take mares on livery for the last few months of their pregnancy so that they are there on site when they fall down and they do that all day every day so if it's ever something you're interested in really really recommend going through an experienced stud. Uh, there's a few things that need to be up to date for your, if your mare is going to have babies. Um, it needs to be up to date with her tetanus vaccinations um, and also some protection against herpes is really, re really advised. Um, the mare needs to be regularly wormed throughout pregnancy, um, but we advise not using a moxidectin based wormer in the late term mare. Um, their diet is also very important. So good quality forage is probably the number one thing. And actually getting fat is as much of a problem as being too thin when it comes to pregnancy. Um, so yeah, we advise that that's something that we can always talk to you about if it's something that you're ever interested in. Um, and we yeah, we work with a lot of really good studs, so it's something we can we can recommend if you ever want any information about it. Um, and S is for sweetage. So I know Emily touched on um, flies earlier, but sweet itch is essentially a hypersensitivity to the saliva of culicoides midges. Um, unfortunately, there is no cure and there's no vaccine at the moment, so early prevention is key. Um, the most important thing is keeping the flies off the horse as much as possible. Um, insect repellents, like we've already talked about, rugs um, and stabling from dusk, dusk to dawn when the flies are at their worst. Um, putting a fan in their stable improves um, airflow and that can help to stop the um, stop things biting them um, and then avoid um, pasture near water because water flies love water. Um, there are a few things that are sort of said to help um, and you know, these are a few of them um, but the most important thing that we would always recommend is a good quality fly preventer and a, and a really good quality rug. Um, <laughs> Back, back to Professor Derek Nossenfeld's fly potion. Um, I'm really going to have to try this. Um, <laughs> I promise we don't have sales in it, um, but it is nanoistant and can go into wounds um, and can be used every three to four days. So yeah, training issues. Um, so it's a sort of alluded to previously actually it's often difficult to decide is something a behavioral problem um, or actually is it pain I think until you've ruled out all causes of, of pain then you kind of need to um, sort of make sure the horse isn't uncomfortable before you kind of push through with things um, obviously signs that you will see um, a classic word we hear is, is resistance um, and so if they're putting their ears back when you're getting on and, and um, doing up their girth and things and then sort of bucking and napping obviously or rearing um sort of subtle more subtle signs of tilting their head and being uncomfortable when you're you're riding them and feeling like they're, they're not willing to go forward so yeah this was a, a nice study they did um in Newmark actually Sue Dyson who's a very experienced vet over there looked at different facial expressions in horses um and then sort of looked, got lots of people to see pictures and, and sort of assess which horses they thought were in pain and which weren't. Um, and she concluded actually all of these things on the on the screen can be a sign of, of a horse being in, in pain. And um, I think tongue out probably <laughs> was low down on the list, but certainly the rest of it can, can sort of indicate um, a problem. And she sort of looked at that relative to lameness and saw that when they did nerve blocks and got rid of lameness but then actually the facial expressions um massively changed so it was yeah quite an interesting thing to to look at but i think the crux of it basically is just make sure if you are struggling with something just absolutely just have a conversation with us and make sure the horse isn't isn't uncomfortable before pushing through so yeah basically um her study showed showed these kind of things so um tense stares and, and tension in the facial muscles um and sort of the head tilting and things like that are all worth noting I think I've gone through most of most of that. Years <laughs> for under the weather. I think we were struggling by the time we got to you, weren't we? Um, but yeah, some some basics to look at in in horses. As I said before, their temperature. Generally, we um, get a bit twitchy when the temperatures go over thirty eight. Um, but sort of officially over thirty eight point point three point five is is abnormal and a little bit a little bit warmer there for the for the foals. And um, again, we look at their their heart rate um, and their respiratory rate, which should be relatively within those ranges of 28 to 44, often very fit 
thoroughbred horses will have will have lower heart rates than that but generally in here the 40 again we get we get a bit twitchy Yeah, so some other things that we would we would say would be abnormal would be sort of a nasal discharge that, especially if it looks like that, then I'd hope you'd be you'd be ringing us. Um, if they have sort of any problems with their eyes, as we've said, sort of even just just mild discharge can sometimes get quite quite poor. And, and certainly, if we're seeing this eye on the bottom bottom right, if it's that cloudy, I'd um, hope you were you were giving us a ring by then. Yeah. So again. I would hope you'd run us before your horse looked like either of these two. Um, but yeah, they can be quite extreme. I don't even want to go on to the next slide, Mark. Really. These for vets. Um, so as you know, we're, we're based at the Redstone Hospital. Um, there's four or five of us based here. We can perform a lot on, on the yard. Now we've got all the all the technology and, and latest equipment so we can do endoscopy, which is your gastroscopes or your airway scopes, um, x-rays and, and ultrasounds and, and dentistry is something that we're all highly trained in, um, and lameness examinations and, and bettings and things as well. Obviously, just down the road, we've got the Super Duper Hospital, which has got all the fancy equipment um, and the medicine and, and surgical specialists, which um, not only are there for us if you guys need to come here, but are also on the end of the phone if we're ever um, slightly stuck with cases, then they're always there to, to give us a hand. Oh, lovely. There we all are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Alex is currently on maternity leave. Um, she should be back in June. Um, and I'm pretty sure you'd have met, met Kate and, and Chris as well. And absolutely, as I've said many times, you can always give us a ring or grab us on the yard. So worming, um, again, I've said it, said it before, please do, do ring us about this and, and just think twice before using a wormer. As I said, we are getting more and more problems with resistance to wormers. Um, and it's a bit like the situation with antibiotics in animals and, and humans that we are running out of options and there's no new wormers coming on the market. So um, it's gonna be us that has to deal with it when we run, <laughs> run out of wormers. So we really would urge you to to get in touch with us. Yeah, the biggest biggest threat um, would be the cyathostomes, um, which are the, the red worms, and then the, the round worms um, in the in the younger younger horses, especially. Um, and on the end there, there's the, the horrible tapeworms um, as well, which we can now test for with the saliva test. So we've only had that in the last couple of years. So it's really good that again we don't have to use um, use wormers unnecessarily because we can now test for the tapeworms. So yeah, as we said, three or four worm egg counts throughout the year. Um, they've always got to be wormed in the winter regardless of a worm egg count um, with, with a moxidectin wormer. Um, a stage of the, the worm's life cycle is within the gut wall, which we can't see necessarily they've got worms there or not um, with just a worm egg count. So we do always advise having, having a treatment in the winter. Um, with a wormer, regardless of their count. I don't think we've got any <laughs> facts. Oh, so, I'm we were saying when we wrote this, or when this was written, we no one could think of anything for X, which is kind of ridiculous given that we do X rays on a roughly daily basis. But clearly, we're all having a bit of a, a bit of a mind Probably. blank that day. Um, so we'll pretend that X is for X rays. Um, <laughs> we've seen some X rays already. Um, so shall I move on to why? Um, so why is for yawning, which I know might seem like a fairly innocuous thing, um, but can actually be a sign of underlying health problems, particularly if um, your horse is yawning excessively. So it could be due to listening to vets talking for too long. I can't imagine that you guys know what that feels like. Um, or fatigue, so sleepy horses, they can genuinely just get a bit tired. Um, but they can also... Um, yawning and uh, start yawning a lot if they have liver disease um, or have eaten toxins and um, so they can get something called an encephalopathy which is basically a problem where their brain is affected by um, liver toxins or something they've eaten um, and it yeah, makes them yawn a lot so it's always something that's good to watch out for. It can also be a sign of discomfort and um, so particularly if it's coupled with grinding their teeth or mild colic signs um, it's something just to look out for. Um, Poor performance, if you're increasing their workload, it's just worth watching out for that. Um, and also orthopedic pain. So um, if they don't want to lie down a lot because they've got a sore leg or a sore back or something, 
um, then they might yawn a lot because they're genuinely very tired. Um, so every horse should be able to lie down um, and have a proper nap. I know we always say that horses sleep standing up, but they actually, they only sort of nap standing up. To get a proper, proper sleep, they do need to lie down. So worth keeping an eye out for. Um, and if you do see a horse yawning a lot, particularly if there's any other abnormal clinical signs, so for example, um, jaundice, like this poor horse here has, um, then it's definitely worth us doing a bit of an examination and probably taking a blood sample to check their liver's okay. Um, depending on their blood sample, if it does show they have liver disease, we might recommend that they have um, an abdominal scan to see what their liver looks like. Um, and both sunburn, so photosensitivity that Emily talked about earlier, um, and yellow membranes or yellow sclera, which is the whites of their eyes, um, can be suggestive of liver disease. So any, any concerns over that to get us to have a look at them. Oh, and Z, how did we get there? Um, Z is for zinc sulfate. Uh, so this is a lovely old chemical um, that we can use to treat persistent thrush. Um, so thankfully we don't see that much thrush anymore, but this sort of wet weather that we've had recently is an absolutely classic time for horses to get thrush. Um, so the best thing to treat it with would be, well, A, to get your farrier to come and cut away as much of the unhealthy tissue as possible. Um, and then B, you can basically get an old square of carpet and put it in a cat litter tray and create your own little foot bath. Um, so you can put some zinc sulfate in, in there with some water and basically walk the horse through it twice a week um, to sort of coat the frog. Um, and that's really nice for just harden, killing off any um, thrush and hardening up the hoof as well. And then I think Emily's actually already touched on this, but um, finally, Z is for zebra. Um, so horse flies can't see striped animals as well. Um, so yeah, zebra fly rugs are apparently the way to go. Also, they look super cool. Thank you very much for putting up with us for this long. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop it in the chat box or, or shout or, or get in touch. Um, I can't actually see if there's any questions in there at the moment. Let me. I'll stop sharing my screen and then I can hopefully see. Yeah, no, I don't think we've got any questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to ask anything and just unmute themselves, feel free to do so. Yeah, feel free to jump in. No? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for listening. Um, and yeah, as Emily and I both said, I think we're, you're always welcome to grab us when we're at the yard to have a chat about anything, really. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.